these things that they were arguing over and these things that came out of Judaism and were translating into into Christianity and those things from Christianity that were reforming and changing some of the things about Judaism all of these things had to be worked out but they have to be worked out in a spirit of love they have to be worked out in the spirit of God's uh, guidance over those things it has to be done not because you have an opinion and I have an opinion and we can disagree but they have to be worked through to the glory of God and this is the problem that we face spiritual maturity We can say we're mature, but if we're arguing over the periphery, if we're arguing over the things in the corner, the Bible says let your doctrine be solid. Teach that and teach that. Make sure it's the most important thing and that it's taught clearly. I hope we do that here. That's my goal. But sometimes we may disagree about things, but we don't have to be contentious toward one another. The Bible doesn't say we have to. In fact, it says find a way to work through it. But Hebrews is not just written uh, about contentiousness. That's the cool part about it. It's kind of like missions and ministry. Do you know we have a mission? Our mission is to tell people about Jesus Christ. That is our number one mission. That's what Jesus left us with in four of the uh, four uh, the four gospels. He mentions the great commission, and in each one of them, and in Acts as well, is mentioned. Go ye therefore into all nations, or excuse me, go ye therefore uh, into starting your own Jerusalem. Go to Samaria and then Judea, and or. Uh, Judea, Samaria, and then the other most parts of the world. It tells us to do that. It says to start where you are. But our mission, our mission is to tell people about Jesus. Our ministries help grow them into what they should be as we teach them God's Word. Somehow, churches and uh, the idea of ministry has become more important than the mission because we do more ministry work than we do missional work. And I'm, I'm saying this not of Woodlake Baptist Church. I'm saying this of all of us. It's very easy. Let, let me give you an example. Have you ever seen something that started out telling people about Jesus and tying it together with some other type of uh, benevolent or charitable thing? Like a food pantry. Let's just use those because I can take you to several churches right now who no longer have a food pantry because the ministry became so encumbered that they couldn't do the mission. In other words, it just became about giving people food. I've got to tell you something. You can give people food all day long, but if they don't know Jesus Christ, they're still going to die and go to hell. But you see, the ministry overtook the mission. The mission is the top priority. That's what we have to do. The ministries then come alongside of that, and while they all have a function and an importance, the ministries have to come alongside, not to create problems in the church, but to help people to grow in the church. See how it works? So when we look at all of this, we see that he was dealing with those kind of things that we deal with today. When he's talking about laying on of hands and he's talking about uh, the baptism and washing and the resurrection of the dead and final judgment. These were issues in the church. Maybe our issues would be a lot different today. I'll let you just use your imagination on some of the issues that we deal with today. But God's word is very clear on those things and it doesn't change where we stand doctrinally. Both Orthodox Jews and Christians believe that these doctrines, these things, may have been issues that probably created friction between the converted Jews and the Christians in the early church. In fact, so much so that Claudius, right before Nero, Claudius kicked all the Jews, not the Christians, the Jews out of Rome. Get out. For six years they had to stay out. But guess what? He didn't kick the Christians out because they weren't Jews. The Jews were fighting with the Christians because they couldn't determine what they needed to do. And Hebrews gives us a perfect picture of this. And when the Jews were able to come back into Rome, the church was way different. This is what you find Paul writing to. So it's really cool when you look at all of this in the big picture. Well, last Sunday night we talked about... Two truths about spiritual progress. And Hebrews points both of them out about spirit. Everybody says, I want to grow spiritually. Here's two truths that you have to at least give consideration to. The first one is spiritual progress is dependent upon our faith and a desire for the things of God. To love what God loves. To want to grow. You have to want to. The second truth is that I'd suggest to you and, and put before you a spiritual progression and advancement are accomplished by God. Some people would say, wait a minute. Yeah, if you're growing, 
It's because, because, because God's walking right beside you. Because His Spirit is teaching you those things. You're not going to grow if you say, well, I want to do a bunch of good works, and, and, and so, Lord, come on down and teach me how to do that. It doesn't work that way. It's when we're doing what He called us to do that He comes alongside of us and begins to teach us. His Spirit is always there. But it doesn't take place without Him. In Acts chapter 2, perfect example. It says, and as they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, the early church, the Pentecost church, as they were doing what God had told them to do, He was giving the increase. He was growing them. We see this reflected in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 3. And this we will do if God permits. So he's saying we need to move on beyond all of these things, but we'll do it on what condition? If God permits. You can't just sit down and say, all right, I'm going to learn everything I want to know about God today. Tell you what, you can do that and it's a futile endeavor. But when you sit down and say, Lord, I don't know anything, teach me everything. Everything changes. Because we've submitted and humbled ourselves before him. How many times in scripture would say, humble yourself before me. I'm God. Lisa just sang about it. He's holy. Do we understand that? Well, that brings us to the passage today. And some of you are going, oh my goodness. That was his introduction? Yeah. And I got 14 points. No, I'm, I'm not sure. Today we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 12. We looked at 3 just now, and this we will do if God permits. But in verse um, 4 uh, through 12, and and we're going to take 4, 5, and 6 first of all, and just kind of lay them out. These passages are some of the most controversial if you listen to John MacArthur, if you listen to Warren Wiersbe, if you listen to some of these other uh, heavy hitters in, theolog- in, in the theological circles. All of them have somewhat of a varying opinion on it. The key that I want you to know if, if as pastor I could convey anything to you, I would want you to know that if you're in the family of God, you're in the family of God. You may be saying, but what can I do to get out of it? What can you do where your parents won't be your biological parents anymore? Even when they're dead, they're still your biological parents. You can't escape it. Your spiritual parentage is the same way. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ and you have been enlightened and tasted and all of the things that take place, you're saved. You can't get rid of the parentage at that particular point because God provided it. God accomplished it just like he did in the Old Testament. God did these things. And when you became a part of his family, you became a part of his forever family. Here's why this is important. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 12, there's a little bit of confusion, and I hope to dispel that today. Let's begin by just reading verses 4, 5, and 6. For in the case of those who have been once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been more made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified in themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. A lot of people have a lot of different understandings about that passage. I hope to illuminate this passage a little bit, not because I'm any great thing, it's nothing new, but it's two ways to be looking at this passage. First of all, As we look at this passage, he's speaking, according to this, to saved believers. This isn't to those who uh, know a lot about God and have kind of rejected it. This isn't to those people. This isn't to those who who are lost but think they're saved. This is to believers. And I'm going to share with you some of the evidence of that, and hopefully we'll come to that conclusion by the Holy, the guidance of the Holy Spirit today in this service. The first thing that we need to look at, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened, if you look with me over at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, it gives us a picture of enlightenment. There are some who would argue that this is about lost people and they've just been on the edge and kind of on the periphery and, and, and they're, they're just ready to just fall off the edge of the earth. They've only been into it a little bit. They've been enlightened. They've only tasted it. All those kind of things. I'm going to dispel some of those things, hopefully through God's word today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, 
He says, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image, uh, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. A couple of things I want you to point out. Do you realize the lost world is blinded? And they may be blinded by thinking they know about God, or they may be blinded just hating God, whatever the case may be, but they're blinded. They haven't been enlightened You may be saying, yeah, but what about the person who's doing all the things in the church? What Jesus says over in Matthew, what does he say in Matthew 6? There will be many on that day saying, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I heal in your name? Didn't I do all of these great things? And Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never at any time in history have I ever known you. There never was a time that you were there and then poof, you're gone. I never knew you. You weren't in, you weren't in my mind or my life at any point, Jesus says. If you don't believe that, go back and study the word never. Out of the Greek, he goes to the high Greek instead of the coin Greek at that particular point. And the word never he uses in high Greek, which the high Greek word was understood never at any time. You could put as many nevers on there as you wanted to, and it would still not capture the fullness of what Jesus said. I never at any time knew you. Ever. You see, the problem with that is, if there was a time that he knew me, he would be lying. If there was a time that I was saved and then not saved, he knew me once. He knew me once. But Jesus says there, I never knew you. To the lost world, the things of God are blinding to them. Oftentimes, they're the people who may be in churches, but are always fighting against the things of progressing forward in the things of the church. They may be people who who think that they're walking in in righteousness, but it's righteousness they've created for themselves. But this passage in Hebrews where it talks about being enlightened, talks about it's been revealed to us, it's been uncovered, it's been exposed. The fullness of all of it has been there and put forth to us. The message of Christ, God has called, we answered. Because he goes a little bit further. Because he uses these word pictures to help us understand once being enlightened, having the light. If you remember John, the one, one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. It goes on to say, and the light came into the world. And the, the man loved darkness rather than light and rejected the light. We find that in John chapter five, oh, chapter one, we see how the rejection of, of the light that came into the world uh, enlightened in light. It's been illuminated. It's been opened up to the shepherds on the side of the hill. They were enlightened that night. Poof. And the heavens broke forth in angelic proclamation. And they said, we got to go see this. The key to it is that they were enlightened. The second part of this is that we can see, we can see that they had tasted now, in, in this, this particular passage, in verse 6, it tells us that, or in verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come. There are a couple of things I want to say about tasted. Over in Hebrews chapter 2, we've already been through this. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, let's talk about what it means to taste. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, but... We do see him who has made for, who was made for a little, uh, was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Same word. Same word. You getting my point yet? Did Jesus just sample death? Was it, did he just go, hmm? Oh, I, I, that's nasty. I don't want no more of that. He gave his life the full measure. Death was death. It wasn't sampled. It wasn't tasted. He tasted death, but that taste was the fulfillment of God's word, and it was the fullness of Calvary. 
This is why when there are those who would explain it away and say, well, these are just people on the periphery. They've just tasted these things. Well, then why would they use the same thing? Did Jesus just taste death? Or did he die? Did he just sample it? You see, for those of us who are Christians, we know that he didn't just sample it. He died. All the way. Dead. He didn't just sample it. He experienced the full measure. Unedited, unabridged, brutal, no mercy. The beating of the Romans and the cross. If you've ever heard the phrase beaten half to death, it comes from the, what was called the Roman half death. In fact, the lictor, and a lot of times people get confused, and I know some of you are going to argue with me on this one. It's fine. I'm not trying to make this shock and awe. But believe it or not, the lictor to someone who was not sentenced by Rome, they could, they could do it as, as much as they wanted to. However, they had determined that if you went further than about 40, that the human body couldn't endure it. But a lot of times the people that were beaten still had to stand trial and still suffered the cross. It was used for it was used for dissenters, for those who were uh, anti-Roman, for those who would be creating problems for Rome. Jesus was not only crucified for the things that God had set forth, but he was also crucified on a political stage. Because he was not crucified as a criminal, he was crucified as someone causing problems in the Roman government, in the Roman world. And they did that quite often. There were roads that were lined with people who had been crucified. But here's the thing, Jesus endured the beating. And if the person doing the beating actually killed the person being beaten, they could face a similar punishment. Because they were to take them almost to death and then put them on trial. It's interesting. Have you ever noticed that what did he do first? Jesus was beaten. Take him out and maybe that'll satisfy the people, but it didn't satisfy them. And so he had the power as the Roman procurator to allow him to be crucified. So, we see in this, we see that he was crucified, he did die, and when it speaks of us having tasted, it means that we are saved. And to those who was being written to, they were saved. Cicero, who was around, and he was a Roman statesman, an orator and a writer, a contemporary of the day, wrote that the cross was the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. Josephus, who was also a contemporary in these days, called it the most pitiable death. So, when we look at this, we understand that Christ died. We understand that we've been enlightened with the truth. His death, burial, and resurrection bring us to a point where we can have a confidence as a part of his family so that we can stand and say that nothing can remove us from God's hand. Oh, but Paul's already said that, did he not? Can't be removed. We're more than conquerors because of Christ, because of what's been done. So we have to come back to this verse and ask ourselves the question, is this verse about losing your salvation? Because the next thing it says, for it's impossible... Let's take a look at the next verse. We see that it talks about repentance. It says in verse 6, And then having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Let me give you a couple things about that passage that you might want to just take note of. First of all, the repentance part of it. It's the theme of this. Notice salvation isn't the theme. You may be saying, well, redemption, salvation, stop. You, you may be saying that, that uh, repentance, excuse me, repentance and salvation, they're the same thing. Guess what? They have some attributes that create a problem in this. Because if we look at it and we say this is the theme of, uh, about salvation, then go back to chapter 6, the beginning of the chapter, just go up a few verses and look at chapter 
6 verse 1, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of salvation. See, they were all arguing how to be right with God. And we know that the only way to be right with God is how? Through Jesus Christ. They were arguing about repentance and how it's supposed to work. This has been the theme from the beginning. In verse 1, it talks about under repentance. It comes down here and it says the same thing in verse 6. Impossible to renew them again to repentance. Now some would argue, well, well, that's the major part of salvation. Yes, it is. But it's about what was going on, the laying on of hands, all of the foundational things that were confusing them at the time. I don't want to confuse you with this passage. I just want to point out some things to you that may cause you to think and say, wait a minute, this will help me to know that I'm saved. So, laying again that foundation of what? Repentance from dead works. If you look at the chapter, and actually before coming into this chapter, you'll see that thematically it was about the elementary teachings. Even the idea of Christ. And what was being taught there. And what was being taught about repentance in salvation. What was being taught about repentance in basically all the other works, the dead works that they were doing. They were trying to justify themselves by saying here's how to do the repentance part of it. Was it the law? What is Judaism? What did I have to follow here? So, let me give you some of the arguments. Because this isn't about repentance or about salvation. It's about repentance. And while there are some parts of it that that they intertwine, let's deal with what the writer has told us that he's dealing with rather than make it into something that it's not. Is that fair enough? Or something that we could conjecture into it. First of all, if this passage is talking about salvation, then it is teaching that the believers who lose their salvation can never regain it back. Did you catch that? But according to Scripture, as long as we're here on this earth and we can sit up and take nourishment, we have a choice. There are people on their deathbeds that have spoken evil against God and been in the faith. And come back. Were they redeemed? I believe with all my heart they were redeemed. You may be saying, but they were nasty. That's your judgment of it. But I don't know what God was doing in their life. But whatever it was, God knew. Did you catch this? Because it says, if you fall away and try and renew yourself again, it's impossible to do that. And the word there is impossible. Can't be done. Not mission impossible. Where it can be done, if you have the right team together. Nope, impossible, can't be done. And it even gives a punctuation mark at the end of this. We'll talk about in just a moment. But if I believe that I can fall away and lose my salvation, do something so egregious that I can never come back, guess what? I can't come back if I believe that this is about salvation. I can't come back. So for those of you who say, well, I lost my salvation. Well, let me tell you, if you've fallen into that trap, let me tell you right here, it says, you can't come back. Now, listen to me, if you believe this is what that says. But let me tell you, I promise you by the authority of God and His Word, you can come back. Let me tell you, there are many people who say, no, I've done something so bad that I just can't, Pastor. Well, there's two parts about the blood of Jesus Christ. Either his blood was good enough to cure, uh, to, to fix all sin, or it wasn't good enough to fix any sin. He came into this all or nothing. And I have to tell you, his word says it's all. All our sin. Well, it also means that if we lose our salvation, it means that salvation depends partly on my works. And once we lose our salvation, I can't come back. And there are those who believe, well, you know, my works have faltered and failed. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to, so I must be just falling away and I can't. Let let me give you a couple of things about these words. First of all, fall away. It's interesting because the word that he uses here when he says fall away is not apostasia. Apostasy 
And if you look up the definition of apostasia or apostasy, it is a falling away or fall, fallen away or fall, and it also goes on to forsaken. Forsaken. The word he uses here stops stop short of that. The word that he uses here is parapipto, which is to fall or fall away, but it's not forsaken. He uses a different word here. Because apostasia, falling away, and if you say I lose my salvation, that is, I'm forsaken. No longer can I come back. That's apostasia. But he doesn't use the word apostasia. He used parapiptos, which means that I'm fallen. Oh, wait a minute. How many of you have ever disappointed your parents? Now, I'm going to use a worldly example here for just a minute. How many of you have ever disappointed your parents? Did that no longer, at that particular point, were you no longer their child? I don't care what they said. Did that make you unbiologically their child? You see, when we talk about the family of God, this is why it was so important to get across the importance of family. Because when you're part of the family of God, I think of the story of the prodigal son as Jesus was telling it. It's a parable. I understand that. But the reality of it is, that that young man that had gone away and had disgraced his father for asking for the inheritance, that father or that son that had gone and lived in riotous living, that son that, that had squandered away his father's resources, all of those things. Joined himself with a foreigner. And i got to tell you that if you were a Jew right now, if you were of the Hebrew uh, origin and you know anything about the history and, and you were a Jew of that day, you would be sitting there at every one of those things. You would have already condemned that young man to be stoned to death outside the house. But Jesus kept telling the parable. And with each new facet of it, it was like, what? Because he just kept building First of all, the son asking for the inheritance before his father died. How many of us would do that today? None of us. Jesus knew what he was doing. And in Jewish society, the father was supposed to rip his clothing if something like that were to happen and basically say, you're not my son anymore, you're dead to me. In fact, if that were to happen, uh, historians tell us that, that they probably would have had a funeral service or that they would have just disowned him, never to speak to him again. In fact, we can see that. But then when he says he took the money and he spent it on riotous living, he wasted and squandered the wealth of his father. And then he joined himself to a foreigner. What? That was what God said all along. Don't ever join yourself to any foreigners. Don't do that. This was a part of their understanding of all of us. You can see why they'd be going, what is going on? They haven't thrown rocks at this guy yet? We'll throw rocks at him. But then not only did he join himself, Jesus went even a couple more better. I love this. Then, he took care of the pigs. I don't know about you, but if you ever want to really do mess something up, go to the synagogue and invite somebody over for dinner and serve them ham. Not good. That was a part of their dietary laws. Now he's joined to a foreigner. He's working with the pigs. Oh, but let's go one more. Some of these guys are about to faint, I'm sure. And he was eating what they ate. But wait a minute, I love this part of it. And this is the concept that we have when it talks away about falling, falling away here. Because it goes back and encourages in a minute. But we'll get to that in just a second. But right now, look with me for just a minute. Jesus says, and then he came to himself. He repented. (laughs) And he came back prepared to do the whole slave thing. Dad, I'll be your servant. Just let me come back. You don't have to give me anything. Just let me be your servant. He practiced that. How many of you ever rehearsed a speech on your way to getting in trouble? You knew what you were going to say. Hopefully they wouldn't just beat you to death or anything like that. So on your way, you, you rehearsed your... I can only imagine what this young man was rehearsing. All of the things in Jewish tradition, all the things in the law that he had broken, all of those things. You could say that he hated his father from the very get-go. But then when he came to himself in my father's house, it's better as a slave. I'll go back and I'll serve him. And when he gets there, 
the father is like, uh, all right, tell me why you're here. How are you going to redeem yourself? Uh Uh-uh. That is not what scripture says. Jesus says, and the father seeing him afar off ran. Wrapped his arms around him in the mess and everything else that he had been through. There wasn't any ceremonial cleaning or anything like that that took place. He had touched pigs. Dad threw his arms around him. Said, get the robe and the shoes and the ring. My son, it was dead, is now back. This is why when we come to a place like this and say you can lose your salvation, what could you do worse or I do worse than that son did? And if Jesus gives us that parable, do you not think he's speaking from the attributes of God what our heavenly Father's going to do? This is a fallen way that can be restored, but it's a fallen way. It's where I'm not doing what I ought to be doing. I'm not growing the way I should be growing. You may be saying, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing, I'm not growing, I'm not progressing. Tell you what, God has already promised that if you'll seek Him, He will put your feet on the right path. He'll wrap His arms around you and say, come on. He took Him back. It was a point where instead of going away from the Father, He was headed toward the Father. But it took Him figuring out, I need to get back to Dad. So, when we look this, look at this, he's not saying apostasy, fallen away and forsaken. He says parapiptos, which means to fall beside, to turn aside, to wander. It is similar to the word for trespasses as found in Galatians chapter 6, 1. We can see that. If you want to look at that, you can see the same kind of idea because in the King James, uh, we, we reads a little bit differently, but the reality of it is it's the trespass idea. But here's the thing. You may be saying, well, you're trying to make it mean something else than what it says. Stop for just a minute. I'm going all the way back to the Greek to be sure I'm giving you what the real word was. How many of you ever wondered? How many of you have ever felt fallen? Yeah. How many of you have trespassed against the things of God? He's telling them. He says, listen, those kind of things will continue if your foundation isn't moving forward. If you're not growing, if you're not doing the things you need to, these are things that will happen. And here's the biggest of them right here because probably some of them had come to the place of saying these kind of things. So what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say that, that I'm not saved anymore? I have no judgment for anybody in this room. If you think that these messages have been here to judge where you are in your salvation, it is not. It's to point you in the proper direction so that you can continue to grow or you can get things right with God that's my only goal and if you're where you're supposed to be with God praise God but don't let these kind of things distract you because he goes on to say in this uh, that uh, about parapetos and about um, uh, the idea of apostasy we see here that there's still some divine chastening that goes on here how many of us, when you're being chastened or punished or disciplined, how many of you like discipline? And so, when the discipline of the Lord falls on us, because we're not doing the things we're supposed to be doing, it could feel like I'm fallen, I'm forsaken. How many of you, when you were being spanked or, or punished by your parents as you were growing up, thought, they don't love me? But now today, when you look back, you say, I know they loved me. Now I know why they said what they said. Now, I'm speaking in a perfect world because I know some of you grew up and your parents weren't all of that. And and I'm not making any judgments here, but sometimes if you don't have a good reference point and I use a reference point like that, it's hard to get there. But in the idea of what God is trying to convey here is that He disciplines those that He loves. And when we are fallen or we're, we're not doing what we are supposed to be doing, there's a sense of His discipline falling on us and it makes us feel like maybe I'm not saved, maybe I'm not a part of this family. I packed my bags one time. I don't know if my mom's here this morning. I know she's in town, but I don't see her so I can tell the story. I remember one time I felt like my mom and dad didn't love me. And I thought it was so mean. And I packed my little bag. It was one of those... You know, the Partridge family bus with all the colors and stuff. I packed, I had a little bag like that and I packed it up with some underwear and a pair of jeans and stuff like that and I made a big production out of going out the front door. Don't you laugh. 
You did it too. Maybe you didn't. But I made a big production. I went through the kitchen, which was on the other end of the house. I could have just walked out the front door. But no, I went through the kitchen. My mom said, where are you going? I'm leaving. You don't love me anymore. She said, okay. She said, you can go, but there's a few things we need to talk about before you go. First of all, I bought that suitcase, and it's mine. So please leave that here. Well, what am I going to carry my clothes in? Oh, the clothes I bought for you? They're mine too. Okay, so I threw the bag down and I started walking. I said, no, 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 no. You still have clothes on. Now, how hard it is to run away when you're naked? It just really takes all the wind out of your sails. So I wasn't about to disrobe. So I went back in my room and I said, I got to figure out something else. But my point was, I felt like I was at a point where they didn't love me. They didn't care. I had just gone through some discipline. I'm not going to tell you what I did wrong, then you'll judge me. But that was my response to the discipline. Let me tell you something. When God disciplines, He's not doing it to drive us away. He's doing it to build us up. And the discipline comes not because He's a mean ogre of a God who just wants to look for reasons to spank you, beat you, or hurt you. It's because He knows you need that then. One of the biggest gripes I have, and I'm going to go personal here, one of the biggest gripes I have against parents today is that they don't understand that concept of discipline. They don't understand that sometimes you do things that are hard to do, but you do them because you love your children. You tell them no sometimes. Say you're not going to do that. Not in my house. One of the biggest things for parents, it's hard. But God loves us and He disciplines us in such a way. We see over in, in Hebrews chapter 12, we see that there's discipline that's involved in all of this. He says in verse 4, You have not yet resisted the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. In other words, nobody had died in this group of people because of their faith. It was coming, but not yet. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My sons, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are approved by Him. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? You can continue on in that, but you will see that Hebrews isn't written to kick people out. Hebrews is written so that people can have a clarity about their faith. Have a clarity about the things of God. What's important about moving forward, about progressing forward. And he gives these things to us. And he shares these things with us because all of these things are characteristic of what must take place. So, as we read real quickly through verses 4. And on down, for in this case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they are crucified themselves to themselves, the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. In all of these things, when discipline comes in, we forget this. We forget, we think we've fallen away in some way, and God says, no, you haven't. But because of what you're doing, you're going through discipline, you're going through things that are necessary to make you stronger, going through things that are going to cause you to look toward me. And when you cry out to God, He's always there. When you come, when you get out of the pig pen eating the slop and everything like that, and you're tired of all of that, and you come back home, the father says, I'll take you back in. Part of all that the prodigal son went through was the discipline of what was taking place. God allowed that. The father allowed it. He could have said, no, 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 you're not going anywhere. You're staying right here. But the father allowed those things to go on. And you know what? You may be in a, in a period of discipline. You may be in a time in your life when you're feeling that way. Maybe you're not. But the reality of it is, God stands ready to say, I want you back. The discipline is there. The hard times you're going through are there because you're choosing to do the things that you're doing, but I want you back. I love you. I want you back. All of this, he gives us 
And then as we look into the next verses next week, you're going to find that right after all of this, does this, any of this make sense? If this was a treatise on, on how to lose your salvation, it sure is a short one. But then next week we're going to talk about the assurances that he gives us because of the things they're doing. And he, he affirms them in love. He affirms them in his power. He, inf- uh, uh, he uh, affirms them in all of the things that they need to continue to do. Doesn't sound like somebody's fallen out of salvation. That would be most horrendous. But it does sound like there are those that may have fallen away. Maybe you're one of those people today. Maybe in your walk with Christ, maybe you've come to a point where you've stopped doing the things you know you should. And I'm no judge of those things. This is individual. Don't be looking at anybody else. The reality of it is some of us have have fallen away. Not only in this place, but I'm sure all over. And again, it's not a charge or indictment against you. But it's to tell you that the God who loves you, the Father who sees you, the Father who calls you son or daughter, wants you back. He wants you growing. He wants you to not get caught up in all the fiduciary things that are all around. He wants you to be focused on Him. So Hebrews, instead of becoming something that we ought to be scared of, now becomes something that becomes our teacher. And it shows us, don't keep laying the foundations. Don't keep doing those things. They're very important. But once they're laid, move on. Continue to grow. Continue to seek. Maybe that's where we faltered. Maybe that's where we could use a little nudge, a little help. I would hope that this message today gives you help. Satan wants you to believe you're out. But all through God's word it says, nope. The greatest example I can give of this is the children of Israel. I shared this with you uh, last week, I think. The children of Israel. Do you realize that Abraham, because of his faith, God chose to use Abraham and his descendants Israel, the Hebrews, the Jews. He chose to use them in all of history. Because not only was there a time when Christ came so that all could be saved, but God still had his people. There was never a time even in all the nasty, terrible things that they did where God said, I'm going to pick me a new people. Not there. And what's so beautiful about it, Paul writes about it and Revelation teaches about it, When this time has come to an end, that the Jewish people still have the attention of God and are still called His people. Now, folks, I I have to tell you that you may say, well, I know some people, some, some folks that are lost. It's not my point. I'm talking about in the global picture of this God still. Here's His people. Here's His people. And we get to be a part. Anybody could have been a part back then. We all get to be a part now if we choose to accept Jesus Christ. And once we're in that family, there's nothing that can remove us. Nothing. If you're not a part of that family, let me tell you, it's a great place to be and I'd love to invite you to be a part of it. If God is calling you this morning, in just a minute we're going to have an invitation. I invite you, if God's calling you, please respond to Him. If you're a Christian and you feel like you've been under maybe some judgment or some things that God has been disciplining in your life or some things that, that have happened and stuff and you're going, oh my goodness, it's just... Let me tell you something. The same God that loves His people, the same God who the story was told, the parable was told about the, the, the prodigal son, that's the same God that loves you and says, I want you back. But you have to choose to make that journey. He's still there. He's still dead. He's waiting on you. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity.